G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Uh, when I started this podcast, I used to introduce our guests as being best in breed. I didn't realize at some point we get kings of industry coming on here and uh, I'm super pumped for today's episode. Scott O'Neill, welcome onto the show, mate. Good to be here, mate. Thanks mate, for having uh, me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you live under a rock, you don't know who Scott O'Neill uh, is, you'd probably need an uppercut. Uh, you've been around for, and you don't look it, mate, quite honestly, you don't look like you've been around the industry for this long, but Rethink Investing has just gone from strength to strength. Uh, you know, you've been pretty open and transparent about your journey, your portfolio, which I think is admirable because you put yourself out there and talk about your portfolio uh, mm. can attract all sorts of uh, opinions definitely, and, and <laughs> quite polarizing. Uh, and I think where you've gone with your industry, uh, in your industry, where you've gone with your business and your portfolio is everything I want to get through today. So mate, thank you very much. Sounds good, mate. Cool. So, I mean, to go back a little bit, uh, mate, I was really happy. You, you, you reached out, dropped a LinkedIn message and uh, I was off the back of the episode I did with the Kill Patel talking about the property cycle and yeah. Um, and yeah, you kind of mentioned, I don't listen to many property podcasts. I'm like, yeah, yeah same. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be kind of like a copycat for, uh, yeah. for everyone else. Not that they're competitors. I think we're all, we're all just trying to put really good information, really good content mm -hmm. out there as well. But the last thing we want to do is listen to what we're, we're talking about all day. Yeah, right. It becomes an echo chamber, doesn't it? Absolutely. But no, I really enjoyed that podcast and yeah, talking about cycles and it's, it was just different from what a lot of the other property podcasts are, you know, just yeah. talking about their own businesses and their, and their own angle and uh and they're the ones i listen to so that's why i don't like you listen just to what everyone else is saying because they mm. all sound the same after mm. a while everyone's just got a different twing or personality trait yeah. on it but uh yeah no great podcast hence uh, i wanted to reach out and oh, say good job and uh yeah, enjoyed it I, mean, I really appreciate it i think that says a lot about you as a person mate we I think you're, you, and we're talking about this just before grabbing a coffee, just like skin in the game, like you're still mm. in the game. There's something admirable, you know, when people build portfolios, but they still want to be part of the journey for a lot of other people. Yeah. There's something more intrinsically motivating you to keep going. And uh, there's so much about your journey that I want to unpack that people can get mountains of info from. To set the scene, and I think this is really, really pertinent for where you're going with, say, commercial, right? The, and this is data that's just come out from CoreLogic literally in the last few weeks. So the residential real estate market sits at $10.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. Super sits at $3.9 trillion. Stocks, Australian listed stocks, sits at $3.1 trillion. And then commercial real estate sits at $1.3 trillion. So you think of it, it's almost like a 10% of the resi market is a space that you play in. But yep. You've obviously carved out a niche here, helping people make extremely good decisions in the commercial space. Yeah. The decision to move into commercial and not be residential, what what drove you there? Uh, it's a good question. And to start, that that tenth is 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 so true. But in that tenth, uh, most of it is geared towards the institutional investors. So we really are in a niche within a niche because yeah. there's not much commercial that is in reach for, you know, the everyday mum and dad investor, yeah. which, you know, say under 10 mil, you know, yeah. there's most of it, a hundred million plus that. That's which really where, skews that number then, doesn't it? Exactly. And that's why you don't hear many commercial buyers agents because the stock out there is simply, it's, it's, it's very easy to keep track of every deal in the country with mm. a small team. That's how niche it is. Like residential is suburbs and there's, you know, thousands of options out there. There's a lot more deal flow. So the, mm. the capacity for that industry to be larger is there. And that kind of brings me to the next point. Like I originally was a residential buyer's agent 100%. Started in 2015. There weren't many around. So there was probably like 20 or you know, <laughs> yeah. a couple of handfuls of them. Yeah. And they're, um, you know, they're, they're, I guess they're the OGs in the industry. Most of them are still around. Mm. And then there's been an explosion of buyer's agents. And rightly so. It's a good service. I think, you know, why a vendor gets represented and a buyer doesn't didn't make much sense. And... Uh, there's some good operators in the industry. Mm. There's there's some average ones as well, but the majority do the right thing because you have to because if you don't, you know, social media and track record gets found out pretty quickly these days. So um, it's, a, it's a great growing industry. It's been good to be a part of it. And the commercial side is still the, you know, the forgotten one and it's because it's, it's so niche. There's no mass business there that can really get created like residential. And, yeah. and um, I guess, yeah, it was around 2016 when like I bought my first commercial asset in 2015, which is five years after my first house I bought. So okay. I played around and bought a, you know, a dozen or so houses first, did quite well out of it, but yeah. I reached a, 
serviceability block in my portfolio. It was around the time, um, you know, APRA was changing rules and stuff like that. So, there so go was, to 2015, we're talking like the interest only caps and yeah, yeah. It was just getting harder and harder. And um, my mortgage broker at the time said, "Look, try commercial because you've got the equity." Because I was doing strata title jobs where yeah. I'd buy a unit block in regional Australia, four on one title, split it, create equity, and it was it was really good back then because there was margin in it. There's not so much margin now. Mm. But um, yeah, I was, I was creating more equity every time I bought. And that was great. That, that's how I rapidly bought, you know, 15 or so houses and, um, and, you know, half of them were unit blocks as well. And there was just, I felt like I was then, st- like I was stalled. I couldn't do anything else. So um, I guess I always had a business that w- which was built off what I was doing personally in my portfolio. So I then got hooked into commercial because I found out the lending was easier, the yields were triple like from a net basis like I bought a nine percent net yielding asset mm. when I was buying five percent gross yielding houses yeah. you know you take your cost out of that you're really down to three percent net three times three that's nine percent so triple the cash flow so I was like this one property is giving me more cash flow than you know the last six or seven other assets I had with debt on it and I was like what what like I'm done with that uh, that was the that was the thought process and um then I created equity with the commercial and I was like, oh, that myth of no growth, no upside, like mm. that's definitely false. So I just went deep into it, like re- really deep, you know, just looking at thousands of properties and read all the books I had in the US. There wasn't much data or um, yeah. chat in Australia, which was a big problem and that slowed my pro- progress. There's, there's a lot of good courses and books and stuff now, so it's a lot more accessible in Australia. but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to, I remember we were doing about, uh, like we, we were up to 50 odd properties per month in 2017 as a business. So we were quite big back then doing resi. Um, and then I moved the business away from it at the cost of revenue. And I did that because I was getting a little bit jaded with buying just houses. Um, it became a bit monotonous just because I was very hands on doing at least half those deals. Yeah. yeah. So I just decided something different and commercial was working and no one wanted it. I remember showing industrial assets to people and they just said, I don't get it, you know. So it was very slow and we went from 50 to less than 10 properties per month type of thing. But, um, yeah, many years has happened since then and it's, yeah, now the commercial's, not, you know, 90 plus percent of what we do. That's incredible. You said you bought your first commercial in 2015. It was less than 10 years ago. Yeah. Has yeah. this thing exploded? Because when I look at them, um, we'll, uh, you, you're fairly open with your portfolio. So it's not um, – I think when you talk about it, there's no ego. Mm. You're just saying, look, this is what it's worth because yep. you made some decisions. So as it stands today, what's the portfolio value of that? Um, it's it's probably like 89 mil, wow. 89. So, um, it, yeah, it, it just grows on itself now. So mm-hmm. I'm not actively buying as fast as I used to. I'm more sort of debt reduction type of uh, side. I focus on the business more mm-hmm. that I'm getting a lot more enjoyment out of that. The yeah. portfolio is there like in 10 years, of, you know, might be worth 60, 70% more in value. So mm-hmm. like it doesn't need to be fed anymore, but yeah. managing debt, working with the banks regularly to get the best deal, um, it's a process of managing <laughs> as well. Like this is probably the main reason why I'd, I don't go buy another 20 or 30 mil because I could with the, like it's the LV, it's LVR is probably all, is, what is it? It's about 40%, 35, 40%. So it's quite low. Yeah. And I just don't, I haven't gone and bought more just because it's like we've got 68 tenants commercial as well. So, and there's, it's quite hard dealing with them sometimes. Like we're dealing with a, Tough negotiation with Audi, the supermarket, Chemist Warehouse, um, multiple supermarkets, medical centers. Like mm. th- these are not just bump the rent up fifty dollars and there you go. You've got to get lawyers involved. You you've got to understand what they're doing in other parts of the country because if a corporation is doing something, there's really you've got to be careful not to blow a deal up because mm. they'll leave or maybe there's upside. These are blue chip tenants that you've got, right? Yeah, yeah. they're corporates and they they mm. really. Um, they, they do what they're going to do, you know, but you still control the asset that they make revenue out of. So yeah. you've got to maximise your position because every time you bump the rent up, say, 10%, you create 10% equity. Mm-hmm. So pushing rents up is very important for the overall wealth picture. Yeah. So if you look back and there's a great saying, you know, you connect the dots looking backwards on your journey. 
and that first property, I've heard you talk about that first property that you bought up, up, up north, wasn't it? And then that then led to a series of next decisions and m taking more action, for example. Do you look back at your journey and go, there's one, there's one real turning point in your journey where you go, this can really work and it, it, it's become that inflection point that you reflect on? Yeah, um, good question. The, look, the first one, obviously, um, mm. I'll like quickly go through that. I was looking at houses in Sutherland in the Shire or yeah. a unit in Miranda. Yeah. They were the same price because the unit was a bit more upmarket and all yeah. that and the house was, you know. It's wild when you think about it now, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and, and I looked at, I, I, I don't know why I was just looking at the valuation uh, about a month ago and like it says the current tenure on RP data, mm. it said 13 years and six months. So I felt really old <laughs> seeing that and I was like, well, I've had, that snuck up because in my head it was always a 10 year ago scenario, but yeah, yeah. 13 point six years now. So, um, and the value was about half a million difference uh, compared, actually, no, it was about 600,000 difference than the unit I would have bought. So oh, right. one choice, that's two or three deposits mm. on smaller, similar assets. So big, uh, big win there. And the cash flow was higher because it was a duplex, essentially, okay. dual, well, house and granny flat. But um, yeah, that, that meant more servicing, more capital growth. Like, so your first property, you've got to get right. You, you, if I bought the unit, I'd probably have half of what I did because all the money was from recycling equity and I was an engineer on a modest six-figure income. Like that doesn't go far these days. So mm -hmm. it's not like I was getting paid huge bucks, but the equity was the, the game changer. So if I didn't have that, I'd have five or six less houses and then that's five or six houses less growing over a 10-year period in a bull market. Mm -hmm. makes a big difference that. But the real big difference one, which is probably a little bit more entrepreneurial, was a unit block in... Port Macquarie. This was my second unit block at the time, five on one title, and yeah. they listed it for seven hundred and twenty grand. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I just calculated what five two bedroom units were selling for at the time, and and it was worth about two mil, you know. Yeah, when, wow. uh, so I was like, why is it listed at this ridiculous <laughs> low, low price? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I just could, I just like did the math. I'm like, all right, I've got to buy this house, but I didn't have the money for it. So um, I quickly scrounged up um, every little bit of equity I had in the other houses and negotiated a long settlement. And then I got a, a West back line of credit, like a basically a credit card debt to yeah. do the rest of the deposit. These offer those like 70K revolving. Yeah, yeah something like Horrible that. Horrible interest rate. Yeah. Like, and it was literally like, you know, it, it bothered me daily because I was calculating the daily rate. I'm going, oh, that's another, you know, my day wage gone, this paying that debt, that type of thing. And, um, but like just buying that, taking that risk, I don't think many people would have done that. Like it was definitely too hard basket, but that freed up a lot of equity. It didn't get the full valuation I wanted, but I, I think it I coughed out another five, 600 grand, which is almost what I paid for the property yeah. for future purchases. So that's kind of how I got places quick. It wasn't just sitting, um, you know, just waiting for growth, there was value adds in there as yeah. well. But the cash flow was always quite high, which meant the serviceability was um, always there. And that was one of the key, key questions I asked the broker. I was like, can I service the next loan after mm -hmm. this? Because it was my business. I, I didn't want to be an engineer forever. So I had to replace income and, and that was the vehicle of choice. Yeah, right. Do you, I mean, you're faced with, in your 20-something, the prospect of, a unit in Miranda or a house in Sutherland and you'd say like most 20-something-year-olds now don't aren't faced with that decision. They're effectively yeah. buying units and that yep. that then limits their ability, to, again, to scale because they're, they're compromising on what type of asset they can buy. Mm. If someone's in that scenario, you know, 20-something and they're, you know, you see it all the time, they're earning good incomes, particularly yep. in Sydney and Melbourne, Brisbane. What, what advice have you got for them? Well, it doesn't have to be Sydney or Melbourne and like you'd be aware of this too, but you just look at the long-term 30-year growth patterns of mm. Hobart, Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, all, they're all growing at, you know, call it 6 7% per annum. Mm -hmm. They're all at different points of the cycle, mind you. Yeah, Everyone's got this kind of big bias towards they think Sydney grows more. The re and I get it. If you buy a $5 million property and it goes to $6 million, that's a $1 million. Mm. Sounds huge, you know. Yeah. It's still 20%. It's the same as a 500 grand property going to 600. Mm -hmm. It's the percentage which is important. So I would just say, look, forget targeting markets you can't afford. Go to the, the cheaper capital cities. 
plan to hold long term, try pick the cycle if you can. Like don't go into a market if it's grown 80% in the last three, four years. Like you've probably missed the boat there because mm. then the affordability is not there. There's probably profit margins for developers to then produce more stock, then more supply will hit the market. Like go into the markets which are due for growth. And that's kind of one of the how we like we still do investing for residential mm. at that's my mantra, go where the value is. It's like that's what Warren Buffett does with stocks. That's what we do with property. Mm -hmm. You know, you, is the replacement value less than what it would cost to build? That's a great metric because that shows value. If um, if the cash flow is higher than you're getting for other parts, of it, you know, then it, it shows the yields there for investors that should over time push more investors towards that product. Yeah, There's just little indicators there. They're very simple. You don't need to get too technical of quoting all the thousands of different stats because that's a rabbit hole. And, and yeah, I think be a borderless investor is the advice. You know, yeah. There's always somewhere you can afford and, you know, otherwise keep saving, do it next year. Mm. That, that borderless investing part can be a real mindset shift for a lot of people, particularly in the, in the capital cities on the Eastern Seaboard where like, yeah. parents are saying go and buy. And I think that's, that's probably a big part of the equation I'll have a chat to you about, which is who's in someone's ear because you've got parents, friends, family, everyone's got an opinion. Uh, yeah. Well, they say opinions are a bit like assholes. Everyone's got one. Yeah. <laughs> and so you've got this trusted circle of people, friends and family uh, that have been there that you know, maybe the parents haven't bought investment properties, but like, why would you go and buy in WA, for example, yeah. horror stories. And then you've got the team and you've got, say, your mortgage broker, a buyer's agent, financial planner, accountant, for example, who are then giving like, maybe four or five sets of conflicting opinion yeah. about what to buy, where to buy, how to buy it, and which, in which entity and structure, for example. How do you then marry that together? Because you would have had this at some point when you, you know, you're, you're trusting your broker, what you're saying is you're capped out yeah. with serviceability. And some people go, right, I need a new mortgage broker. In fact, you said, I'm going to take their advice and move into commercial. So there's a certain element of trust that you've built with your team, mm. how do you get that to kind of cover the noise that's coming, say, from the trusted circle? Yeah, look, it's it's a tough one. Like it's easier said than done. Just go, oh, you you know, you've outgrown your current guys. Move. So you, mm. look, you always take into account what they say, but you know your journey better than everyone. Like the responsibility is on you. Like no one's gonna get you twenty properties. Like you need your own mindset. You're the one that has that random goal. You know, so. There's ways to get it. And when you reach um, roadblocks, your current guys start holding you back, that's when you need to move on. Because there's always a bigger fish or someone who plays with a different level or type of client. Yeah. And that's what I found. There's mortgage brokers, if they don't have that larger mindset, can hold you back. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they don't get the overall plan. So having someone that sometimes has done what you want to do is, is a really key part of following. So, you know, that's, that, that's what I look at. Like, you know, I wanted to follow people that were in places that weren't where the average person was because I didn't want the average result. And 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 I found that the residential, the reason one of the other reasons I, I kind of left residential is I saw at the time there were other people building sort of large property portfolios of say 50 plus houses. Mm. I just didn't want that. I, I had, you know, I had enough. Like there was a guy I followed back pre-GFC actually, you know, and he had about 200 properties in Logan, you know, it was quite literally bought out everything <laughs> this is back in the days when there was um you could just get a valuation a desktop refinance like it was creating a house of cards essentially you yeah. could just get debt recycle it buy it like you could keep buying as long mm. as you could play with those desktop valuations absolutely then the gfc hit and i saw him go from 200 odd properties to um around 30 40. Wow. And i thought that's what happens when you play the game too hard where you're not actually creating real value, you're just playing a leveraging game. And I just knew that was the wrong strategy for me forever because if you, it, it's not how you would run a business mm. or maybe a tech business where they don't have profits. Don't <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't like that type of business. I like um, cash flow businesses because yeah. for me that's real money and um, that's how I wanted to run my portfolio. So uh, I then left my old, old mortgage broker. I, was, I, I had a really good one at Aussie Home Loans back mm. in the day. They were great. They, you know, one of the reasons I bought a lot of houses was from them. But as soon as I kind of floated the commercial idea past because I wanted more cash flow, deer in headlights. Like, they, oh, don't do that. Oh, we've got, we can get more serviceability through Resi. Um, and I just knew I, just, I needed a different person. I needed a different accountant as well. Had a good one. But then, yeah, needed one that had more of a business mindset. Mm -hmm. So I went sort of more larger scale, 
kind of accountant and yeah, just just moved uh, and, until it took me yeah till now almost you know 13, 14 years to find the right team and yeah, um, nice. they're the perfect team for now and I hope they're the perfect team forever. Um, but if not, can, there's always another another advisor you can welcome to the circle. Yeah, nice. Again, you you built these portfolio of crazy properties, financially free by well, like twenty eight. What's the definition then of financial freedom at that stage for you? Well, for me, it was replacing my income and about half of my, my wife's income okay. at the time. So we, you know, we, we made a good dent into hers. And so the first goal was to replace her income because yeah. I, I moved to Port Macquarie so I could chase my career. Like, mm. and it was, there was two parts to it. One, it was part of the career journey. Like, you know, it was an area manager role. You know, I was, I was twenty at the time and had 150 people working under me so it was a really uh, like I was very lucky to be in that role I thought so I traveled lucky but you also got some real skill sets that they saw value in like a young head on shoulders but can manage a a larger team you're probably destined for like a corporate career at that point right and it was super challenging because like being a young person in management like they especially like the average age of the workforce in that area was it was late 50s you know and they're, they're truck drivers they're people operating mine equipment there's the concrete batch operators like you know technically a rough crowd and um i'm just some guy out of sydney with a uni degree like and it, it was very tough but i you know i enjoyed the challenge but it was more tough on the wife because i pulled her out of a job she loved mm. in sydney effectively her career was put on hold for this so you know goal one was just sort that out she it's very hard to get a job in port macquarie at the mm. time and she ended up landing a job in the council and super political and all that kind of stuff and it's funny it was not funny but we had a council sticker on a car and like a car would get keyed all the time because they hated people working in the council you know which i get um but um yeah just things like that were always in the background and uh yeah so re- that was a goal so get her out of a, a role but like she would always work mm. um just something that she could choose to work in but uh, it went well because those unit blocks were pumping out the cash. The interest rate was lower at the time. Rents were growing quick. So it was a, the equation was getting more favourable by the month almost. So that's why we were trying to fast track things. And, and yeah, uh, replaced my income uh, a few years later and, and that's, that's when we quit our jobs. I remember calling the boss and you know, he said, where are you going? I'm like, nowhere. Just got a property thing on the side. Or, no, I, don't, I can't remember what I said. It was literally like oh, I just – been investing in the side and so disinterested in it. I think he was a bit pissed that I was uh, <laughs> I was leaving because they, they were half paying for my MBA as well because it was part of the fast track to, to go to that next level in the yeah. career. And so, you know, I, I left half. I didn't fulfil my duties to them and I get it. But, yeah, we, we went to Europe for six months and, and that's like we spent less than we were earning from the property. So it, it felt like... That, that was when we made it from that point, yeah. Mm. Now? Has that, uh, obviously, income's replaced, you're well and truly set up, beautiful family home. What's financial freedom look like now? Because people listening to this going, this is insane. Like an yeah. $85 million property portfolio, business going great guns. Mm. Why? <laughs> uh, and it, look, it's a good question. Like I was saying when we had the coffee before, there's, you know, why, why do you then push growth? And I think... Yeah, I'd never even thought about it until you asked me. But I, I think because I've had time off work where, you know, we go to Europe for three, four months every year. We've got a house in Greece because the wife's half Greek. Her dad lives there, so we've got no family in, a, uh, in Sydney. So, right. like, going there is important. And and when we're there, like, I, I can feel like I switch off. Like, I'm still doing emails. Like, you know, it's like you. If you, mm-hmm. if you Once you're a business owner, it's a curse. Yeah, yeah. yeah it chases you forever. But... Um, yeah, that laptop comes with you everywhere you go, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and it's always in the back of your mind. Like yeah. even when you – and especially in Greece because the time zone is the worst case yes. time zone. Like literally you will Overnight. go to bed when the emails start coming through. So you don't want to stay up too late and then look at the email because then you'll see 10 action yeah. items. And then the morning, so it's you wake up you're wondering what bombs are about to blow up or, you know, what, what big ticket items you've got to deal with. So it's always like, you know – Eight hours of the day is, is going to hit you straight up in the morning. So, um, But look, you switch off during the day and I think that allows me to know what it is like to do nothing. And and we did the six months, you know, 2016. Mm. Or, you know, like I was sort of working at the time, um, 
but like it wasn't a real true business to be honest at the time. It was um, a hobby. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah, we basically then um, yeah, we I guess I've seen what it is to to not progress as well, and, and that's so financial freedom now to answer your question. It's just I've got the option to work or not. It's not a. It's it's just doing what we want, and and. What I want to do is just kind of progress in life. Like I think that's the definition of happiness, enjoying the journey. Mm. The destination is not the happy part. Like, you know, I've never been someone who goes, buys a Lamborghini and shows it all off. On it. Like that doesn't excite me. Yeah, it strikes me because I'm like, see, I mm. don't see the bloody Gucci belts and things like that. And yeah. There's something that's, I don't know, elevated in, in your way of thinking. There's, a, there's something like, uh, I don't know what it's called. Like it's a stable datum. They say whatever you buy becomes your norm you know like i don't know if you've ever bought something nice mm. that becomes your average uh staple date and point mm. so you buy that new house it's you know it's going to feel lovely and great for a while but the, the excitement shines off and then it's it's just a house you do notice it when you go back, back the other way and go oh i used to live there yeah. and, you know so you you kind of need more to feel that same rush so that's that's why people buy fancy things to get that rush but for me it's more uh, you know, I get a lot of enjoyment with building the business and hiring good people. Um, one thing I've really seen more importance is time because uh, mm -hmm. I've been very hands-on with the business and so that's why we're in a bit of a scaling stage now to, to kind of get, you know, the ability so I can kind of work on important things more than the really granular stuff because then you can kind of influence more people and mm -hmm. and that's a process too. So, yeah, yeah I don't, don't know exactly what the definition of, of wealth is but um it's almost not thinking about the wealth i, I haven't thought about uh, how much i need for a, lo a long time and it's more about what i want to do and that's yeah it, it's nothing about revenue and it's it, i love it it's refreshing it's it's really refreshing because i think and you probably see it in plenty of industries the vanity metrics really start to come out the portfolio is worth x mm. for example the, the car is this the house is this and it's that's cool, but yeah, I think when there's something, there's a bigger game being played. You probably see that, yeah, as well. Um, does your wife have a big role to play in this and keeping you somewhat grounded or family? Oh, she's way more grounded than me, like to the point where it's almost frustrating. So, <laughs> I, and I'll explain why. Like, I remember, uh, I don't know, you, you buy the house and you go, and it's almost like she didn't care, because like, mm. and she always said, I, I'd rather just live in a, a little shack as long as we're happy. Like, she grew up on an island with thirty thousand people in Greece, yeah, okay. so. And when you go back there, like where, you know, you, you're driving cars that the doors don't close pro properly and the brakes are shot, like it's really old school. Mm. And Greeks aren't as, you know, showy, like especially on the islands. Like, you, you know, the, the rich people, well, there's, there's not that many rich people there, but you would never know because they're wearing the same shirt from 30 years ago. Like mm. it's, it's that old school kind of hide wealth scenario mm. there. Um, I'm in an industry where you have to talk about wealth. Like if I... Yeah. Um, I said once that, uh, you know, I, I remember my parents didn't even know I bought six or seven houses extra because I wouldn't talk to anyone about it. It was almost not an embarrassment thing, but they would question it. They'd wonder, you know, you just didn't want to go down that conversational route. But then when the buyer's agency started, it was the only way to be taken as a, as a credible human on the other side. So, you know, you have to start talking and then yeah being in newspapers and that was probably the most uncomfortable part of the journey oh, that's, that's when I mean, a news dot com article yeah I've seen asked, those, yeah. yeah and they're very clickbaity <laughs> and like yeah and you feel very exposed and then like there's everyone just knows exactly what you own and and yeah, but like the the positive thing was then people would want help and then the business grew off the back of those kind of viral articles mm. and and that's yeah we, I try to keep them to like one a year because they, they, you know, there's lots of requests for those articles because it sells their papers, you know, mm -hmm. and they're backed by, you know, what is it? News.com is financed by uh, realestate.com and Sydney Morning Herald has mm -hmm. domain. So they need their property section humming in the background because yeah. that's a big part of their revenue. So and this is a great story when you have tens of millions of dollars of real estate yeah. and like no one's heart's going to bleed for you, mate. That's for sure, no, isn't it? Yeah. No, no. Um, <laughs> Getting on the same page as a couple and, you know, you probably deal with it. I mean, we deal with it a lot where maybe one partner is a bit more bullish than the other, one maybe more risk adverse and they're trying to build a financial house effectively with yep. two different blueprints and it becomes not a sticking point but how do we come to an agreement that 
we need to take some action. We need to make some decisions mm. without risking what they've built as well. Yeah. So how did you sort of, it's meaner, isn't it? Your yeah. Life. yeah. How did you sort of meaner get on the same page financially? Uh, good question. It was sort of day one. Like I remember like when we bought that first house, it was pretty ugly looking. It was literally fibro yeah. on a highway. And, yeah. um, and I, I took her there. This was, you know, I'd, I'd known her for only a, a year or so. So it was a property under my name my yeah. finances and I just said what do you think because we were I chose that over the Miranda unit which was quite nice it had views and stuff and yeah. we we're going to live in that and she said um oh, what does it return and that was a bit of a, a moment because I was like oh well, I can tell you it was 11,200 positive per year and and that was interesting because it allowed us to then travel because that's about what we were spending on a Europe trip so it was a paid Europe trip wow back then um to do what we wanted for like a few weeks so um, she understood the benefits of cash flow and that that was a difference because freedom was important um having the ability to travel for long periods yeah instead of just getting that four-week block that we're lucky to get with a, an employee where we now had longer than that um okay. so in between jobs we were traveling even longer so i'd time leaving a job potentially around a trip and mm. do an eight-week trip um, because we could, we, there was a bit more cash flow to play. The buffers were there, and um, yeah, so I think time was always more important than luxury items. Instead of just going into the nice house, start to start it, we went investing, and in, I don't know the exact number, but from memory, it was nineteen houses before we bought a family home. Wow! So and and there was commercial in that too. So we did a lot before we went into the owner rock. Did that eat away at you? I mean buying investment properties and not having your own home because i feel like some people uh, i'll yeah. speak from personal experience i'm like at our second i was like then we got served with like this notice to leave i was like right never yeah. again yeah, will i be yeah, under yeah. the thumb of a landlord and and that was that that turning point to go and buy a home but um did it oh it was and i'll get to another question in a second was it always part of the plan at some point or did you just go right we need our own home uh no i was always against the home because i knew i only wanted to do it once so okay. i was never financially in the position to buy what i wanted and i just never saw the logic of buying a two-bedroom unit sell that pay agent fees pay um, stamp duty again and then go on a three-bedroom townhouse and then as the family grow all right we need the four-bedroom yeah. house it was four-bedroom house or nothing okay. and because like what i didn't want to trade up because that's what everyone does you know they their wealth builds as they get into their thirties and forties and, mm. and then their house goes with it and they, you know, they sell every five to 10 years as a result. So I thought that was just inefficient. I'd go, well, I'll invest and then wait until I could do the, the bigger long-term house. And the, it's yeah, the forever home was always part of the plan and that was going to come whenever it came. Yeah. Nice. Uh, you talk about intergenerational wealth. So do we a lot. And when you think back to one generation where Mina grew up yeah. and what your, uh, you know, where you started as well, and within one generation you've completely changed the financial trajectory of your family. Mm. Two very, very small kids. Yeah. Um, and and I feel like the next generation, it, the, that uh, disparity is just going to get bigger between the haves and have-nots in yeah. property. Yeah. So intergenerational wealth through property within one within one key generation has just gone to a new level mm. where do you look at the future in like property and and when the the people that aren't buying are going to get so far left behind yep. how do you then say mate you've got to be part of this market because it's happening with or without you yeah yeah no it's a good question and um like i've seen like i follow a lot of other economies because you know we, especially we spend so much time in europe and i've seen mm. what happens in mature economies like we're still a an emerging market you know, yeah. and that's why Australia is so attractive all of Asia wants to live here all the European like it's a desirable high growth safe haven viewed mm -hmm. you know place so like you get your money into a property here long term you're fine I've seen what that happens in other markets where it goes the other way like I'll use Greece as an example like the average wage a young person gets there will never allow them to buy a house um, bank lending is really hard there there's um, house prices are still randomly high but all the older people own everything Australia still got an opportunity to get in. It's getting harder um, and it will keep getting harder to the point where what you said is like kind of the majority of cases where you won't get in. That's just a, a harsh like reality. Like the New York market, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And um, and there's probably plenty of other markets we'd never think about, which is like that. Like there's mm. just the older people own it all and then the younger don't have no chance. And um, at least we can have careers and you can study away or, you know, build a business. You're like, you can, you can make income if you got your wits about you. And, uh, and then, yes, you could then buy houses in other parts of the country. It's definitely possible. It's getting harder though. And, mm. um, and it will keep getting harder because the cost of building is going to keep going up. They're going to, immigration will, will always be a, a lever government's play mm. to get votes, to boost the economy. Like it's going to be part of reality, whether we like it or not, both sides of the government, there'll be mm. periods where they, slow it down, speed it up. But the net position over the decades to come is more people here. And uh, yeah, it'll get harder and harder. So you just gotta you just gotta get in and um and then you will be in one of the haves and those who, you know, complain and do the other sides will be the have nots. But but I do feel for them. Like I'm I'm not I'm here for, you know, one good reason is I got in at a good good time. Two thousand and ten after the GFC. It's been a 14 year bull market since then. There's been a few sort of hiccups on the way, but time fixes everything in property. And um, and that's my advice to anyone else. Like just get in, it is expensive now, but you've seen those articles saying the average house price in Sydney by year, whatever it is, is gonna be three million. Like, mm. you know, it's it's mathematically going to happen, whether mm. we like to, you know, admit it or not. Like money is devaluing against property. So get in if you can by any measure, just, um, just, yeah, look outside your backyard. The investor mindset. So that's, I mean, you, you talk about the home buying mindset. You're yeah. like, buy what you can, when you can get into the markets, like quality yeah. assets, for example. That, that is time-tested advice that will never go out of fashion yeah, yeah. and never get old. Where do you see the wheels fall off for the investors? Um, and I'll give you a few examples here, I guess, purely from a, a lending perspective. The attachment to credit cards, for example, the car leases, uh, lifestyle creep uh, plays a big part in that as well. Yeah. A lack of even financial literacy about what's coming in and what's going out on on all sorts of scales of incomes as well. Uh, chasing shiny objects. Uh, yeah. And what I mean by that is the investment plan at the start has them veered, detoured, and they've heard someone here on a podcast or they've enrolled in a course here. So when you hear all that and you're like, here you are as mm. call it the finished product, for example, how does someone stay the course and not get pulled in so many financial directions as well? Yeah. And it's a good point. Like the lifestyle creep is something people don't talk about enough. Like, cause I see with a lot of my high net worth clients and you know, I medical even, professionals. I, and yeah. I think it's, I, I go to scale because yeah. someone going from 80 to a hundred, 110, 20 K in corporate, the shirts aren't from Oxford anymore. Yeah. They're from MJ Bale, for example, or the watch isn't, long jeans anymore it's iwc yeah, for yeah, example yeah. and they've effectively spent that pay rise and yeah. then you go to the next bracket of say 200 to 500 it's yeah. like the holidays aren't to bali anymore they're to the maldives yeah. and yeah. You know, the the hotels are five star and the cars are all european yeah. uh, on leases and then you go to your high net worth clients and yeah. that's just an uber different level of wealth right yeah. so you keep going yeah no it, it's 100 percent right and that's all after tax money too so you know there's the education their kids and the stuff mm. like that so you could be a you know a specialist medical professional on you know seven figures it doesn't matter that you know you'll lose a big portion of that with tax and then a couple of cars on a lease um but yeah you lose most of your money buying your your ppor your house because no matter how much you earn there's always a house in sydney or melbourne you can spend all of your money and that's what the trap is that most people fall down like especially you know, in the, you know, my age groups in the mid thirties there, there's a lot of people who are getting the real big pressure to buy the family home. Mm. And like I'm from Sydney, so, you know, Eastern suburbs, you, you need to spend three, four million, million to get a freestanding house. And that's in the cheaper parts of the East. Absolutely. You can definitely go multiple times more than that. doesn't matter what you earn. Once you buy that, that mortgage is going to basically be a boat anchor on your investment journey forever. Mm. So the plan's out the window at that point. But I get it, the pressure's there. Like you don't want the mortgage, you know. I, I had to move, couldn't even tell you, but I, I've moved a dozen times in the last 10 years and it's, um, it, it gets to you. Like, you know, your furniture gets ruined, you got to, you lose two or three days of your life unpacking and pack, like it's, it's a pain. And then, you know, 
there's different types of landlords. So I totally get it. Um, it's not for everyone, but it was very hard to stay the course personally, even for someone like me that I could map out things, you know, to my 50s in my head from where we wanted to go. But yeah, like there was always like, oh, do we, that's a good deal because you're going to look at the suburb you want to live in. And at some point you'll be able to, if you're lucky, be able to afford it. And that that's the moment where you get tested. And mm. if you you go down that route, your plan's done. Um, but we, we delayed it at least five years more than we wanted to. And, uh, and it, it made a big difference. It meant we acquired assets that we never would have bought after the house was bought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people hate when you say delayed gratification, but this is effectively what it is where staying the course becomes the extremely hard part when yeah, the income's go up. It's like now you can actually cash it in and buy the family home, but at what point can you do that? Mm. Uh, I feel like we pay you know, real life monopoly is what I call it uh, when you start buying property. You got all the different, you go buy the cheapies, for example, yeah. and you go buy the blue chips, or, you know, the blue and the red uh, and, and the green properties, for example. Uh, and then I see a lot of people just going round and round collecting their $200 as we pass go, which is effectively yeah. their paycheck. Going round and collecting your 200 bucks and trying to save up, pay off your mortgage, for example, have a few weeks holidays here. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like it's the formula that works anymore. There's very little left over at some point for families to proactively save. I think I worked it out. The average savings account across Australia is 37 grand. Now that's average. So there's people have more and there's people have far less yeah. and the ability to save. So when, more, when prices increase on average nationally around, so we'll call it $1,500 a week, median house price growth per week, and people are saving on average $300 a week, it's very, very clear that you cannot keep up with the property market as well. Yeah. So when you hear that, what a what advice or what guidance can you give to people say, how do you break this cycle of going, this is not working, work hard, save, because you've been in a six-figure career, mm. MBA, you almost saw that corporate career laid out for you going, I'm going to be there at this level, general manager at this level, on path to CFO at this or yeah. CEO at this level. And at some point you broke this just going, this career, is, it's not stacked up, it's not stacking up for me. Yeah, and, and look, that was my way of staying ahead. I mm. thought just chasing, chasing promotions and, um, you know, that, that I guess that was the initial goal. So, yeah, I was very focused on getting out of where I wanted. So, you know, it's funny we talk about how money is not as important. It's very rich me saying that now because it wasn't the case. Like mm. we were incredibly frugal. Like I, I travelled a lot in my younger years, um, you know, like but I worked when I was overseas. Like I worked in Canada as chef. Like I just didn't want to come back in a negative position. So I'd work extra hours to make ho you know things like that viable i guess but mm. but yeah no we we definitely um saw there was just a yeah it, we were falling behind otherwise so yeah we just basically wanted to um chase career promotions and and, and then we worked together as a couple to set a plan to to save as much as possible and you know we again it's it, take jobs that pay you a little bit extra and that's what we did that's why i was in port macquarie it was definitely not a lifestyle choice it, like it was early 20s I wanted to be in Sydney mm. with mates and going out and all that stuff and and to the point where we drove that Port Macquarie drive um, at least 30 times a year right. and that, that I dreaded the Sunday afternoon because I knew I had a four, four and a half hour five hour drive ahead of us and you know that that it got longer the more you did it like that was the longest drive like it was horrible but um but it was for the greater good so a lot of people just don't make those little sacrifices. Um, they want to do jobs they love. Sometimes just do the ones that pay a bit extra. Like there's a lot of fly-in, fly-out workers who get this. They do it. They're going to just do this horrible, you know, rotation system for a few years. But the, the result is they're going to have some money that they can then invest. And once you do that, then you can go back towards your lifestyle because you'd rather have options in your 50s mm -hmm. to then step back and not be hamstrung to a job just because you've done some hard yards in the early years. So, because the compounding time, like you mentioned, 1500 a week, get the house early on, time is literally the key. So, sacrifice early, it pays off later. It's basic but harder to, to do in principle. Mm. When you planned out your journey, you talked about it a lot. Um, and again, no ego when you talk about this, because you don't strike me as that type of guy. Did you always think you'd end up here? Like, was this always like I'm? Um, it's like someone that goes, "I'm going to get fit and 
nothing's going to get in their way. For example, I'm going to do an Ironman under this type of time frame. So this result that you've got, it doesn't surprise you that you've got here? No, no. Look, from 25, I thought I was going to be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So before then, no. Um, but I, I always had like, you know, I wanted to be an airline pilot because yeah, okay. I like traveling. and I, I you, watch many, well. you watch Top Gun too many times. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I look, literally, I did the, um, uh, you know, I, I went to ADFA and like, tra- wow. you know, I started the training and I failed the medical because I had some asthma as a kid. So I remember they put us in a salt tank and the lung capacity dropped 10% or something. So mm-hmm. that one moment changed a lot because you, once you join the Air Force at the time, I think it was a 12 year commitment or something like that. But it, it gave you free training to then be an airline part because you, it costs 150K to mm-hmm. get the hours up and stuff like that. But but I was always like wanting to chase jobs that at least paid well um, because it gave you options to, to travel and do all that stuff and surf more and you know go to Europe more, all those things. So rather than just do a baseline accounting job that was never for me but mm-hmm. where, when it became real was when we we're in Port Macquarie and I was playing around with spreadsheets and seeing the returns I was getting and this was had about three or f- three or four years track record by then and I, I just basically you know assumed I'd get the same rate over like a 30-year journey and you know you could see per age group like you just mapped it out and put different variables in these randomly created spreadsheets and and I can see it was going one direction I just mm-hmm. had to keep doing what I was doing and uh, and it would have got there. Just It just happened probably 10 years earlier than I thought. So, yeah, that's fine. Um, but, yeah, I always thought this is going to happen. I was very comfortable with numbers and, yeah. and large numbers as well. Like when I was taking debt out of younger years, like it was never a concern because I just knew the mechanics behind it. Like if you put an extra two zeros on the end of it, totally fine. I was very comfortable with that. It wasn't how much was owed to the bank. It was really about how much income is getting created, how big is this business or property portfolio becoming and the, the scale is where you make the money in it. Mm. Yeah, nice one. I guess the question behind that one is as you're on the journey and you're trying to tell people come with me, they don't believe you but when you've got here they're like, I want what you've got now, Scott, and you're like I've been trying to tell you this whole time yeah. you, but you want to only see the finished product, you don't want to see someone on the journey. Did you have any of that? Did you encounter any of that yourself? Uh, look, mostly just by randoms calling you out on the internet, like after a big article, okay. you know, and it was only the first article that was really bad because it was a big clickbait, like zero to 12 mil or something in five years. I don't know. It was one of those type of okay. um, very like residential clickbait type and um, everyone just goes, oh, you got money from your parents and like which we didn't. Like we had... We started, it took us five years to save a 60K deposit, you mm-hmm. know, and I've worked McDonald's, I was a field hand surveyor, I worked five years in a pub, like it did all, uh, you know, all that stuff to get that money. Yeah. But they just think that you got a free ride. So, um, yeah, it was like I think it's the same metrics apply, but, you know, people are pretty pretty respectful. I think there's so much education out there now that um, those who want to believe it, like, you know, they get it. There's, I, I tell people that you don't just jump straight into commercial now. You still start and do all the same stuff we did. Cut your, you know, cut your teeth first, learn the ropes on residential. There's less downside. It's less cash flow. There's potentially less upside, but the downside is the key part because if you have a bad day in commercial, you won't invest again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I've had bad days in stock markets and I just think, don't see the value in it now it's not worth it like i'm not going to put large sums of money on a company that i don't control you know because what variables have they used to justify their business multiple valuation like it's just it's a i feel like i've got an inside inside trading advantage with property why Mm. would i then not have an inside legal advantage in in shares so and it's because i've lost money in shares so you, you can lose money in property yeah and yeah, you just you start where you're less likely to lose, and that's just classic freestanding houses, and then move up towards the uh, risk profile as you move on. Mm. So, yeah. I want to talk about that unpack that journey because, I mean, you're pro commercial, and everyone's like, and I've seen it. And you, may, you may cringe sometimes when you read some of these Facebook groups. I occasionally jump on there as like, mm. call it market research, and like, right, I'm going to go buy my first like first property is commercial. Mm. Are you looking at that just going, hey, like you said? build a solid base and a foundation of some 
quality bread and butter investment properties that will give you some cash flow and yep. some equity to then move into, would you call more, uh, commercial a bit more for a mature or astute investor? Yeah, like, and it depends on your wealth position. So yeah. I've got a lot of first-time clients who go straight into commercial. Right. Straight into a $10 million commercial too. Like, and they're generally like a business owner. So, you know, like, like you know, they might have a, an IT business and they've just sold a big portion of it and they've got all this cash in a bank. Mm. I don't see the value in them going, oh, I'm going to buy five 750 grand houses and like because they've already got the wealth so their job's now to protect the wealth and kind of like create a new business because they've already made it essentially mm. so go buy a shopping center might have 10 tenants supermarkets um medical center you can go straight to the trophy asset which is that intergenerational wealth like you've got a freehold property that's one of the best properties in that town that's when you go straight into commercial even if it's a three million dollar one, like yes, it's fine. But if if you're a mum and dad, and you've you know squirrelled away five hundred grand, and that's all you've got for ten years, you don't go straight into commercial. Go buy two or three houses, and um, and it depends on your age as well. If you're sixty five, you know, like our oldest client's eighty seven. Like you know, there's no point in him getting into residential because he just needs cash flow now. He'll enjoy it. Like. Know, hopefully he lives to 100 plus you mm. know there's still a pl- fair bit of time in the market but what's the point of him buying a, a negatively geared or po- just evenly geared house with debt like or even if it's with cash like what do you, you get five percent gross return take your outgoings you're back to three percent like he's not going to live on that income mm. like it's it's below inflation so he'd be losing money again and the capital growth he's not there to sell it and he doesn't want to refinance probably won't be able to as well so Everyone's got a different story, but generally younger people leverage into residential property because, you know, you'll get your 6 7% growth long term and that's going to be a creator of a future deposit for a commercial asset. So if you've got three or four of those for 10 years or five years, pull out all the refinance at once and then you use that nice chunky deposit to go into a higher, better quality commercial property and that's kind of how we help strategize with our clients. That's a wrap for part one of our interview with Scott O'Neill. He's an absolute weapon when it comes to investing in commercial property and sharing his journey as well. We hope you like part one. Stay tuned for part two of our interview with Scott coming up shortly. Mm-hmm.